Today on Locked On Canadians, is there an extension for JF Hulin Laval? How Owen Beck can earn himself an NHL roster spot? And again, more trade talk. You know we love trade talk. Your Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 1079 of Locked On Canadians. You know we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where you get your team every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. My name is Laura Sab, also known as the Active Stick, and I'm joined, as always, by the wonderful Scott Batlove, Habs Eyes on the Prize, which is very fitting because, Scott, we have, I won't say we have Laval news, I will say we have a Laval report. Yeah, it's a weird thing because I talked about this in the episode that came out this morning, is that uh, DLC in Montreal reported that, hey, it seems like this contract is basically on the one-yard line at at that point and i believe it was the fourth period today that came out with uh coaching news like dan bilesma getting hired in seattle that a multi-year extension was in place for current i guess i can say current rocket head coach uh jean francois hool which just kind of makes my timing on that episode all the better it's unclear if the assistants are also coming back yet we haven't heard anything official from the Canadians or the Rocket or any other sources uh, around Montreal. And I'm waiting if they were until that June 1st date to potentially announce that because I think that's what was quoted in the original article there. And a lot of people in the replies I saw, there were a lot of schools of thoughts on this, and this is actually going to probably bleed very well into our second segment is one half is, wow, he's done a really good job kind of getting a lot of these players ready for that next step or helping to rehabilitate a lot of these other players who have come down through waivers or just to take that next step as a prospect to work on some things. And other people who look at, well, they were terrible to start the year and they missed the playoffs at the end of this year. Why would you bring him back? But Scott, uh, yes, like for that reason, I wanted you to bring that up and then tell me where you stand your honest opinion about this where do you stand uh, i'm i'm okay with it i would really like to see how the staff changes a little bit i think kelly buckberger did a really good job and got a lot out of some of these defensive prospects i look at the growth of like i said in yesterday's episode a guy like william trudeau who went from guy to someone that i can see playing nhl games as soon as this upcoming season if there are knock on wood injuries the work arbor jack i did to improve his defensive game and his patience and his even his offensive output while he was with the rocket for a month or so logan my growth though that's all part of that coaching staff i am very much okay with it and this is a stamp of approval i think from not only john sedgwick the now gm of the laval rocket and agm of the montreal canadians but from Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon and the player development staff, and then Jeff Molson above them, this is a synchronization of tiers. I think on that, uh, the lions and the ECHL have promoted a guy up to in a couple of other roles there. It seems like they're getting all these, and I hate to say ducks in a row because it seems kind of cliche, but that's what it is, is they're streamlining this organization and they are getting that mantra drilled in top to bottom here. he, has made some decisions that leave me scratching my head. Martin St. Louis has done the same thing. Dominique Ducharme frequently did the same thing. Claude Julien did the same thing. Michel Therrien did. Coaches do these things. It is not a unique thing to Jean-Francois Houle. And if a bunch of people in this organization are liking the progress they're seeing, and especially if like Martin St. Louis gets a guy from the rocket and goes, good, he's ready to go in this lineup immediately, that is, I think, a really positive impact here. A uh, multi-year could mean two years. It could mean four years. I would expect it's probably a three-year contract, but wouldn't be shocked if it's two and that they kind of see where they're at at that point. It might run the same length as Martin St. Louis. And then 
we you know figure this out in a couple of years again. Scott, do we have any indications as to how the players feel about JF Hu? Because I remember when the last coaching change happened, some surprising news came out because we praised Joel Bouchard so much uh, for what he had done with the Rocket and the transformation that he was a part of. But later on, there were whisperings and ramblings that he wasn't necessarily a favorite of the players and he was kind of like a tough guy as opposed to kind of a player's coach. I don't know where they stand on JF Hu. Do you have any inkling or educated guesses or insider knowledge? I, I think with JF Hu, and this has been the hard part this year, is that I haven't been able to get to Rocket games like I used to, where you can talk with the coach. But he, you know, he will say like, hey, we have to be better at these things. But he doesn't throw players under the bus for things. Uh, when I got to speak with him and, you know, in the media scrums after the rookie showcase last year, is that he went, even with mistakes in a game, that he looks at this and goes, I'm happy with he bounced back from these mistakes. You as a coach that he can say, yeah, there were things that we want to work on, but here are the things that I want to focus on. And there are ways to be positive while also keeping an objective view that you're not just saying, yeah, it was great because that's what people want to hear. And for him, I think he has, he's not, you know, someone who's going to like take it easy on players, I, you know, watching practices, they work hard. They battle hard in these practices because this team has a drive and a will to succeed. And that's part of the organizational philosophy. I think Martin St. Louis is the same way as that. He tries to build the players up and to find the positives in things. And yeah, sometimes it'll be a, it won't be a name thing that like, Hey, we didn't do well on the penalty kill, or we have guys who aren't doing what we need them to do with the puck there that he can call out a player without naming them. And I think Joel Bouchard is someone who, he was hard on players, but post game, every time that I talked to him was he went out of his way to praise the good things in, in games where they had a half ECHL lineup. He went, I don't know how much you can, ex I can expect to, you know, push these guys, a bunch who just got here like yesterday against one of the top teams. I think that the players like playing for him. You see guys going out there and it means a lot to them. I look at Jakob Dobish, like, Winning games means a lot to them. Every single game is important. You see guys who want to play for their teammates, and that comes from a coach instilling a strong culture within this team. If you're not going to play within the bounds of what they are looking for, you will sit. If you don't want to put the work in, if you don't want to be part of the team, you're not going to get those same opportunities. And... I think a lot of players have gotten that message and those that didn't, or maybe didn't want to be, uh, you know, were either moved on as you know, this organization has done in the past or just, you know, had to learn. And that's part of it. I, like I said, I think June 1st, we'll probably hear about this, but if this is leaking into national media, national media, <laughs> uh, we will, I'm assuming that extension is a few little bits here and there. Um, and I'm obviously not as well versed as Scott is in the Laval Rocket Melia, but I will say, you know, talking about those players that don't buy in, um, I think that it's a huge luxury, like when you are a coach or a general manager, and instead of inherited players, you're able to sign and choose the ones you want. A lot of times that's going to take some time for you to be able to get that, right? It's, it's going to take some time for some people to be shipped out or traded away or... Uh, you know, you sign on with different people, but I think you have to buy into the vision no matter what. Um, and if you aren't part of that, doesn't necessarily mean your career is over. It just means that this team doesn't necessarily want you around because at the end of the day, particularly with teams like the AHL teams where there's always going to be roster changes because somebody's moving up, somebody's moving down um, and this and all of that, like there needs to be unified identity of some sort. And that's really, really my belief. And so you know, it remains to be seen, as Scott said, it, it's it's going into the mainstream media right now. So we have no reason to doubt that report at the moment. Um, and all, all signs point to positive things about it. I will mention one thing, though, is that the Laval Rocket now next season, our expectations for them will be much greater. Um, they can't squander the season in the first couple of months. And I think that's it again, is that they, I think they know what they need for next year. And I think the expectation is you made the playoffs two years in a row. You made a deep run the first year and we're out in the play and round the next year. 
and this year you missed it by a game after struggling down the stretch, is that, yeah, injuries are a problem, but the expectations are we are a playoff team. And I think Jean-Francois Hull, with the staff that he's going to have in there, there will probably be new vets. There are going to be some guys that are not coming back. Just simple as that. Uh, whether they were unhappy with their role or the way things went or something else, I think that this team next year, we're going to see, it's going to look totally different again. There's going to be a lot of young guys. And I think that, like I said, off the top, Jean-Francois Hull has done a really good job with a lot of these younger guys, getting them ready for that next step. And next year is very much as, as important in that step there with so many new prospects uh, joining the fold. Speaking of next year, I did talk a little bit about Owen Beck in the Monday episode, but I did want to give Scott a chance to weigh in. What can one of our favorite prospects and uh, practically adopted by his family, Scott, <laughs> um, um, what can he do to earn a roster spot? So we're going to be talking about Owen Beck next. first this episode is brought to you by FanDuel it is winner take all time in the NHL and the NBA we are right in the thick of the playoffs as you know and FanDuel America's number one sports book is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet that is $150 bucks to bet on spreads money lines player props and more and for me honestly the Playoffs are the best time. I bet against the first the Leafs, and then I bet against the Bruins, and I haven't been let down yet. And you can do the same. Uh, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, Scott, let's talk about our good friend, Owen Beck. The reason I say that uh, practically adopted into his family is that Scott was covering the rookie tournament a couple of years ago. Uh, was it last year? I think it was the year before. It was right after he got drafted. It was two years ago. That... <laughs> and he was sitting right near Owen Beck's parents um, and basically made friends with them. <laughs> Mark Dumont and myself were sitting there and in front of us were Owen Beck's. We had bumped, actually. We had sat down to have lunch before the showcase started at one of the restaurants by the arena and their family recognized both of us there to come up and introduce themselves, which was mind blowing in and of itself. It's uh, it was, it was crazy, but uh, they did sit in front of us. And as we're watching this and we're, you know, saying all these nice things and everything. And I was like, okay, if he makes a mistake, I can't say anything because they're going to be <laughs> right behind me and they're following this on Twitter and I can see my name popping up and it's like, well, keep it together, keep it together. But uh, we Thankfully, have finally reached... Owen Beck had a really good tournament, didn't he? Yes, he was one of, he was probably my favorite prospect in that tournament. I thought Philip Machard and Yuri Slavkovsky were also great in that showcase. Uh, Slavkovsky was, he was still raw, but showed a lot of those things. Owen Beck was the guy who was just everywhere that you wanted a player to be in face off defensively is where you need to be offensive zone. He's doing the things you want to do. He was doing every little thing that you wanted out of him. And I, that is what I love about him the most. I'm curious if he will go to uh, that showcase again this year, seeing as he's played in the last two, or even if they are going to the showcase this year, I haven't seen anything announced, but it's also it's May 28th May. when we're recording yeah. this. Um, so, Scott, I, I, I alluded to this a little bit on the Monday show, but I did want to get your take on it because there are kind of this there is kind of this sentiment rolling around after uh, another podcast discussed it, saying that uh, what you would want from Owen Beck uh, to feel secure that he's going to be an NHL or even on the third line um, was that he needed to have a more dominant season in the OHL this year. Um, I don't necessarily agree or disagree. I don't think that his season was as dominant as people expected, but there was also a trade involved, right? And he has been developing defen defensively a little bit better um, over the course of the season. But I don't necessarily think the fact that he wasn't like the most dominant player in that league, I don't think that necessarily um, has any has any real bearing on whether or not this this player will make the NHL next year. I think for me, it is all entirely in his hands from here on. And he's currently in the Memorial Cup, uh, you know, but after that, like in this, in this, let's say 
restart of the season and training camp, et cetera, et cetera. It is 100%, I think, in the players' hands. Right, Scott? Yeah, and the thing with this is that some people are like, well, maybe his ceiling is, you know, a third-line center, and I'm What's wrong with that? Two... There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Getting an everyday NHL player out of a second round pick is always doing, getting an everyday NHL player out of almost any pick is always considered, should be considered a good thing. Uh, I, yeah, top three picks, et cetera, like having an asterisk to that. But I've seen a lot of people being like, well, what is he, is he not going to be our second line center? And it's like, I don't know why people are magically inventing roles for him here. Yeah. Peterborough was not good this year when he was there and he was, doing a lot with a little or trying to do a lot with a little. And he got to Saginaw where he has done a lot with a lot uh, for that team. And I think this upcoming year comes down to which mindset are you in? Do you think, Hey, he's better served playing bottom six NHL minutes right now, whether that be as a winger or a center, like kind of like Jake Evans and Sean Monahan have done uh, for the Canadians in years past here, or do you want him with the rocket? where he's likely to play top six minutes. He's going to be a face-off guy, a penalty-killing guy, maybe a power play face-off guy. And learning and taking in those big minutes, it's it's going to be an interesting thing because it's it can be two schools of thoughts on that. It's, do you want him here now? And the hard part is, where do you fit him in this lineup? You have four NHL centers right now. In Evans, Dvorak, Doc, and Suzuki. You could consider Alex Newhook a, I can say he is an NHL center. I'm not going to say that maybe that's his best position, but we know that he can play that position as well. Any, is there a role for him? And if not, don't try and jam the square peg into the round hole, make it make sense before you do anything else. And I think that's important. Um, I I'm he is probably the one that I'm most interested to watch this upcoming year. Philip Mashar as well, but Owen Beck has had so much around him and I have so much in his game that I like that is so mature professionally that he's someone that I could see absolutely being like you cannot send him down because he has earned that NHL roster spot like out of training camp and out of preseason and force Ken Hughes hand to trade somebody else, wave somebody else, do make something happen. Um, uh, he has the skill set for, and I think he has the mindset for it. He's a really mature professional player. Uh, so it all, people are going to freak out if he goes to the AHL. And honestly, I'm not too worried if that's the case. It might just be a space thing. And like we said, in our five part series, we want them to advance forward this year. They don't need to be a playoff team. It's super neat if they are though. Absolutely. And that's like, for me, like my perspective on this is that, the comment was, you know, is he even going to make the NHL at all? Well, like you said, Scott, you can't fit a square peg into a round hole. If you think, okay, he's he should only make the NHL if he's going to be a top six player, et cetera, et cetera. No, but as a third line center, I, I think that that's not necessarily his ceiling. Like when he got drafted, we were all talking about this as his floor. If that's where he ends up, that's not the end of the world. The Canadians will need a very good third line center if they plan to contend the way they keep promising to. So for me, I don't like I'm not too worried about Owen Beck and his development. He does seem to be the kind of person to grab the opportunity by the horns and not let not let it go, not let anyone, um, you know, get in his way. Essentially, like he will be the one to force the Montreal Canadiens hand. But I really excited that you brought up Philip Mayshar because we don't talk about him enough on the show. And I think it would be really interesting if that's what happened with him in, in, in training camp. Everyone expects him to be in Laval next year. Um but maybe what if what if he's the one that kind of forces their hand and then somebody else, you know, somebody else um, ends up falling by the wayside. Like there's so many variables in this offseason, um, including who the Canadians can possibly trade for. And we had a great listener proposal um, and I want to bring it up coming up next. All right, let's talk about this listener pr player proposal. Scott, do you want me to read it? Do you want to read it? What? I'm going to let you read it uh, because I'm kind of looking it over as I go here and I want to bring up Cap Friendly as part of this as well. Uh, all right. So this comes to us from our our, our good friend. Sorry. Um, uh, da -da -da -da, our good friend Claude S who has been giving us uh, some great ideas of late. Um, and this is one of them. So, 
Hi guys, based on the following criteria, I've put together a list of teams that might be willing to part with players in their mid twenties on reasonable contracts. I would love to get your thoughts at, at other possible candidates and what you think the price might be. And here are the criteria that Claude has chosen. Aging roster, limited draft capital, shallow prospect pool, and four to five years from contending. Oh, sorry, or five years away from contending. All right, so his first team is Tampa Bay. The player is Tanner Janot, 26 years old. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I, I I will let you finish your, your thoughts on this because I have a lot of thoughts about uh, Tanner, Tanner Janot. So. Okay. Uh, contract up for last year was 2.665. Uh, would need to be extended. Go for it. So Tanner Janot is signed uh, through this season. He is uh, done after this year. He got a two-year extension. Uh, it was filed in arbitration, So, and he expires as a UFA. And my thing about Tanner Janot is, I don't know, because I look at his numbers and that every single year he had one very, very good year in Nashville. 24 goals, 17, a good being very generous in this is that 24 goals, 17 assists, 41 points in 81 games every year since then, five goals in 56 games, one goal in 20 games with Tampa, and then seven goals in 55 games this year with Tampa Bay. He had 40, he has 42 career NHL goals. Nick Suzuki scored what 32 this season alone. And Everything about this player screams, we have Josh Anderson at home. <laughs> and for me, I, I, I don't get it. Uh, he's now, what, 26 years old. He turns 27 uh, tomorrow on the 29th. Uh, and for me, a guy like this is just, we already have one Josh Anderson. I don't think we need another one. And I also think Tampa... <laughs> he is cheaper. He's two point six million dollars, which and he's younger. Yeah, but it's I. He's also been injured a lot. Yeah, and for someone who plays a physical style game, I have a lot of my own concerns about that. If they're buying low, as in Tampa is getting rid of this contract, and you have moved out Josh Anderson or whomever, having Tanner Janot, I guess, on your fourth line is a huge bonus, but. I don't think he's going to want to be traded somewhere that he's going to be a fourth line forward on a team that isn't going to the playoffs next season. All right. We've got four more of these. So we got to be quick. Washington, um, the players, Dylan Strom, he's 27 years old and his contract is four years at 50 million per. I just don't see Washington trading him. I believe they are very happy uh, with him and they also don't really have any other centers at this point. So I can't imagine them uh, willingly trading the guy who was playing on their top line or second line. Most of this year uh, team Pittsburgh player, Michael Bunting age, 128 years old contract two years at 4.5 million per. I want to say no, just because I hate Michael Bunting with a passion. <laughs> it's, also, Dubas purposely traded for him in that terrible Jake Gensel trade, so I don't see him uh, potentially being... And he also was, again, modified no-trade clause, so he can probably pick uh, which teams he... Uh, he has a 10-team no-trade list next season, which I assume would fall into Montreal's hands. Let's take a look at his scoring numbers here. Uh, 23 and, uh, 79 games, 23 and 82 games, 13 and 60, and then six and 21, uh, this year with the Penguins, not terrible, but again, a lot of this screams slightly better. Josh Anderson at home, maybe <laughs> him only being 28 blows my mind. Cause he should, he's, he was at the Psalm and he was at D day and all these other old timey <laughs> things. So um, and also I just hate his face. So there's that. I know that's not a very good reason for anything, but it's my reason for it. So we're going to have to deal with that. Listeners. When I saw this email, I thought, yay, Laura's going to make an age joke. And then yay, Scott hates this guy so much. I can't wait to, to hear about it. All right. Team Seattle player, Jared McCann, age 27 years old. And his contract is three years at 5 million per. I would love this. 
if there was someone that I could, you know, have slide into being in the Christian Dvorak role and without being Christian Dvorak, I would love it to be Jared McCann. Uh, I'm just looking at his numbers basically since he got to Pittsburgh where they just didn't protect him in the, in the expansion draft traded him to Toronto who because to, and Toronto didn't protect him where he was picked by Seattle and he's put up 27 goals, 40 goals and 29 goals. He would be an incredible ad for the Montreal Canadians in, in that role. But like Dylan Strom, I can't see Seattle parting with him because I think they consider him a really key piece of this roster. But if he, for whatever reason, were actually out there and available, I'm not saying I would move heaven and earth for him, but Jared McCann would be a huge boon to this Canadians lineup to have a legit, very good 3C uh, or even 2C. If you want to move Doc to the wing to play on his line, you could do that. Jared McCann would be a slam dunk, a huge boon for Kent Hughes there. It'll be interesting to see how Dan Bilesma deploys him now that he's the coach in Seattle again and what the lines look like. But Jared McCann for me is someone that I, if he were available and offered to the Canadians, if the price is right, you take it. Absolutely would take that. And finally, this player is to Claude what Nikolai Ehlers is for you, Scott. The price would be steep, but imagine Slaff and this player on the same line. The team is Los Angeles. The player's 21 years old. He is an RFA. And Scott, can you guess the name? It is Quentin Byfield. I am all over this. But as Claude points out, this price would be very steep. This is, and here's the thing is, if he was available, like I think it was going back a year into last year, the year before that, where he wasn't quite lighting it up in the AHL, wasn't really setting the world of fire in the NHL, wasn't really sticking anywhere. It seemed like, hey, they might just trade him. He's not working out the way they wanted. This, just like Slavkovsky had his glow up this year, Quinton Byfield went from 22 points in 53 games in the NHL last year to 55 and 80 this year. 20 goals, 35 assists. He's six foot four. He's still growing. He's 21 years old. Claude is not kidding when he says that the price is steep, but I am absolutely envisioning a line that is Slaff, Doc, and Quinton Byfield. And for me, I'm all over it. I am I'm, all like literally as soon as I saw that, I was like, I'm all over this one. Yes. And here's the thing is again, you're paying for a second overall draft pick. You're paying for a guy entering his prime coming off a career year. You're going to have to pay the team to acquire him. And then you are going to have to pay this player as well. And that means you have to shed the money. And again, if for whatever reason that LA has lost their mind and Quentin Byfield is actually on the market, this is one that I would move. And I mean, big name prospects for this player. I think Lane Hudson and Reinbacher might be on my non-touchable list, but I would listen to if LA wants David Reinbacher and they want to trade Quentin Byfield in some kind of deal for that. I am absolutely listening to that phone call. I know Kent Hughes and, and the staff like to stick by their guys, but I am looking at this player who can play left wing, can play center, can fill multiple positions there, has scoring touch, has size, has skill with that size, that I am absolutely all for this. Uh, his time in the OHL was incredible, watching him put up points and assists. And this year, his next step in his development has been just a treat to watch. As someone who doesn't watch a lot of LA, but I will watch Quinton Byfield highlights. I would be all over this trade if that were if he if that were even a remote possibility. Sign me up yesterday for this. Absolutely. All right. Sign us up also when we're when we're talking about this. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Um, and uh, as you know, we are your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast, so you should be subscribed to our podcast wherever you get your podcast or on YouTube, or why not both? Do both. That's what I think. Every single podcast platform, um, like I said, free and available every single day. If you want to find us on social media, the podcast is on Twitter, L underscore Canadian. Uh, I am at every social media thing at the actor stick. Scott is at Scott Matla. Um, also, you can always email us at locktoncanadians at gmail.com. Where do you think we've been getting these ideas from our listeners so far? And I really love getting your emails. I really wholeheartedly do. Uh, so make sure locktoncanadians at gmail.com. You can also leave comments, questions, et cetera, et cetera, in the YouTube mailbag. In the meantime, please thank you. Uh, come back tomorrow because we will see you then.
Thank you.